So I want to introduce Tor Kingdon, Kathleen Edwards of Here Kitty Studios. Hi. Um, so, so the the initial idea of this between editing sounds and sound editing, uh, I had actually mistyped it. I, I usually say it as and sound editorial. Um, it, and Kat thinks it's a stupid title, actually. Um, so, so we'll let her we'll let her get on that in a, in a little bit. But, um, but my idea of, of of what that title means to me is that is that the picture editor is uh, is editing sounds. And this is something that we get a lot when we, when people see um, our our bid or our proposal for for how we intend to do the work. That uh, they'll say, well, why do we need dialogue editorial? We've already edited the dialogue. They edited it with the picture, um, and, and that is true. And it's been edited for content at that point. I think Alan actually talked very well uh, this morning about um, uh, which which I was glad to be able to see online uh, about. Um, sound ed or picture editors editing sounds being something that is is uh, has become more and more expected of that that the sound that people hear out of the uh, out of the um, the uh, the avid or the final cut or whatever like that is expected to be uh, a bigger and bigger deal. The the idea I had on this was was talking about how what we do is is different from that. Um, that, that a lot of times um, people don't really realize as they're listening to the, the work that's happening in, in Final Cut or, or wherever it's happening, uh, how much more can be done with sound and how much more can be told to tell your story. Um, and I think that's been illustrated pretty well by things that we've seen uh, so far today of in, in all that jazz, um, the, the, the Foley solo that narrows in on these sounds that, that um, that the character's hearing, uh, and, and, and Michael Stern's work that, that adds so much more to it than I'm sure was there in the initial editing of the picture. Um, so, so really there's a, there's a technical part of that where the, you know, the sound translating from the picture editorial to us uh, is, is done through a, a series of files, OMFs or AAFs or whatever they are, that you might think, as soon as it opens up in our system, it looks exactly and sounds exactly like it sounded in your, uh, in your other system. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. There's a certain amount of translation that we have to do um, comparing what we hear in the OMF to what we hear on, on your guide track uh, to make sure that we are getting, as a starting point, where you intended it. Um, you've spent a lot of time with this movie. Uh, usually at this point, we're just getting to know it. Um, and, and so this, that's part of our process of getting to know it is going through all those files and, and searching through them, obviously on a full length feature that's gigabytes worth of uh, just audio and then, um, and then the video as well. Uh, and, um, and so there's a certain amount of that process to look through it all uh, and get it all. But then the real work begins once we've sort of gotten it to that point where, where we have an understanding of where you were with it. Um, and that's when, uh, when as a dialogue editor, which is primarily what I do in our workflow, um, the, 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 the real dialogue editorial starts. Um, what has been happening up to this point is making sure that you can hear the dialogue you need to hear, making sure that um, the uh, the story is being told in words. Um, what we are then doing, or what I am doing, or whatever, whoever the dialogue editor is doing, is getting that ready to mix it. And, and um, getting that ready to make it sound like it takes place in one scene. The, the classic example of, I use of dialogue editing is if one side of a conversation was shot with a tree behind the person that has birds singing, and the other side was shot with a generator behind them. Uh, and when you take those two sounds with the boom pointing that way and tweet, 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 and the boom pointing that way and whirr, and you edit that together, it doesn't sound like it's in the same place. And sometimes it wasn't in the same place. Sometimes it was shot in, on two different days and two different locations even sometimes. Uh, and, and what the dialogue editor is doing, what the picture editor was doing is making sure you can hear all the dialogue, making sure you can hear that story. What the dialogue editor is doing is getting it ready to make it sound like it all takes place in the same place, uh, in the same scene. And so it's, it, it's 
filling in those spaces. It's making those transitions work in between tweet, tweet, and were, uh, and, and, and making it possible to, to make that all play within the same space. Um, the same kind of thing happens with, with sound effects, that the temp sound effects or the, or the music that, that was put in there isn't, um, it is kind of a placeholder. You can use the same car door closing 20 times in the space of a movie and everyone knows as you're watching the rough cut that, okay, the car door closed, that's fine. But you're not necessarily closing the right kind of car, it doesn't necessarily have the right sound. So that's really when Kat comes in and she starts going into the, the sound effects editorial and then gets into the sound design, which I think is what, more what she wants to talk right. about. Yeah. Um, for me, my talk was going to be, what's the difference between sound editorial and sound design? Um, and the difference to me really is, you know, I came to sound, as most people do, through music, a lot of people do. I'm a, I'm a musician. And I grew up, you know, listening to my grandmother, who's a concert pianist, play music, and listening to her, and, and like she would play Russell of Spring, and I would get visuals in my head. I would lie under the piano so I could feel the sound rush over me. And it was, it was pretty early on that I realized that sound is extremely powerful. I mean, pictures, visuals are very, are very powerful, too. I mean, we have all have pictures in our heads from movies that we, we've seen, and they're extremely powerful. But sound can be even more powerful, I argue, because not only do you hear with your ears, but you hear with your skeleton. And now they're doing research to find that you also hear with your skin. Your skin hears independently from the rest of your body. So it's taking in information that is independent, so you feel the sound. Because sound is an actual wave, it hits you. It hits your ear, which vibrates the, the bones in your ears to make you sound. So if your whole body is hearing that, it's not surprising that music and sound, when it's done well, can take you and transform you to a different place. When I think of sound design, sound editorial, I think, is it's kind of like notes. You pick notes, you put them out, and it's exactly, you know, you need them. They're important. Sound design is more like a song. You start from the beginning, you build, you have a cohesive picture, piece of emotion, a story that you're trying to tell. And when it comes to film, that is sound design's job, is to take that story using the same tools that I use all the time. I use, you know, all the c computer tools and the, the sound effects. But I have to talk to each individual director about their film. What is the story you're trying to tell? Why is this important to you? What is the flavor of this? What is, what is the emotion of this? Um, and I have to adapt all these same tools to create this picture and this story. And it should always, I mean, I believe that dialogue is king. That's the story. But there are times when there, are, there isn't any dialogue. And how do, you, it, how do you convey that sound? I mean, some sound's easy. Like we did a Steven Seagal picture and there was a lot of explosions and, and fighting and, and doing the Foley on that was fun. I get to beat up a lot of things. Um, but it's not subtle. It's not, and then there's the psychological dramas where you're supposed to be telling the story of the character inside their head. So what is that? How do you do that? Um, you know, I grew up being a violinist. I started playing professional theater when I was in high school. And, you know, I played theater, I played opera. And if you're, if you're lucky enough to be a first violin, you could sit on the outside of the pit and you could see all the action that was going on stage. So I would try and practice, I'd, you know, memorize my parts so I could play and watch. Because I was fascinated by the, the play of sound and music and how it affected the actors on stage and how it would... Sorry about that. How it would um, either enhance the story or take away. Um, when I moved to LA, I took these skills, my music skills and my theater skills, and I landed a, an internship with Jerry Sackman, who's a five-time Emmy Award-winning music editor, 
crazy guy. I love him. He did all the Star Trek, so he'd always say, I've been in space for, you know, decades. And he kind of was. But he was, he was kind of a genius, and I got the opportunity to work on a scoring stage with live musicians and live composers and, and talk to them about movement and how they did that. Um, I also got to play with um, Zoo District Theater, which is an internationally known theater in LA. They specialize in a, in a form of theater called Commedia de Art. And that is where they bring the musicians and the sound designers and everybody on stage, and they perform and interact with, with the actors. So, you know, whatever the actors do something. You know, and I would mark it with a, with a sound design. Very nice, lovely. Um, with, with a violin or with a cello or with a, with, with a rock, with what, anything. But it was very stylized movement. So everything had to be split second timing. And the difference between a second is and doing that consistently was a hit run that you know, ran five nights a week for six months to, a, or, you know, it would be a complete flop because it's boring. If it's, if it's sloppy, it's boring. And so I really took these ideas together into my sound design. When, you're, when, I'm, when I'm designing, I design movement. It may not, I, I try to be very subtle in knowing that, that sound is visceral. It affects you on a, on a physical level. I like to do a lot of design that's below what you would hear and more feel. And that's why working with, with a great mixer is really important. Somebody who gets it um, and has the tools and, and the techniques to do it. So we can work together as a team. I'm like, no, 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 I, I want it to feel. And, and just the difference between a semitone or a frame can make the difference between, yeah, that's all right, it was good. Or it can take you somewhere. It can propel the story. Um, one, of, one of my favorite things to do there's a clip that, that we'll show you. There's a local um, filmmaker here, Julie Reichert, and she did a film called Warrior Woman. Um, and we love working with the local talent. Just one reason we moved here is because we wanted to do that. But she had, she had this scene, and you know, we're at the end of the process. So she had seen the scene a hundred times. And there was the music, and, there was, and she, you know, she thought it was a good scene, and it was done. And it's great, and the music is fantastic. Um, and so I just took a little bit of time, actually a lot of time, to design this scene. And it's very subtle. It's very, it was kind of below the, below the surface. And when I played it for her the first time, I was a little nervous. But I could feel her in the, behind me. She was moving forward and moving forward and moving forward. And she said, oh, what did you do? I could feel energy, I could feel tension there that I had never seen before. I was like, okay, that's great, that's, that's my job. Um, that one, I, that one I, got to, I got to do right. And so, to me, being able to take the sound and make a cohesive story with the director and with the producer is extremely important. I mean, there's lots of times of people that, I don't have time to talk to you, just, just do it. I'm like, mm, okay, fine, I can do that, but that's, then it's kind of my, my vision. And, and that's my job. I bring my expertise to your project. That's why you hire me. But I also, I feel that my job is to also get into, your, into the story, into your head, and what, what are you trying to bring out so I can help further that. And I love it because, you know, I've done sound design from, I don't know, from horse racing stories to... To, to Buddha stories about peace. Um, and I learned from every single one, and I learned different techniques from everyone. And, and I try to bring a different flavor to each project ah, that we have. Do we have that clip? Yes, yeah, please. So we're going to do a before and after.
So that's as that's as we got it. Um, the the sound work that was in there was done by C.K. Barlow, uh, who did the score and did a fair amount of sound design before we got to it, uh, and also the the late great Sterling Grant um, did did a lot of sound work on that as well. So, you know, going to Alan's point about what you know how that has changed over the years, um, you know, in the in when I first got into into post audio, which you know was a, a quite a while, quite a few years after he first got into it, um, not. Never mind. That sounds worse than it meant. But um, but but even in the in the in the early ages of digital, which is which is what I mean to say, uh, it, we would have gotten a, a music a piece of music with that, and maybe maybe a little fire, maybe some crickets at the end, um, but but not as much of sort of crafted work as that. Uh, but then Cat was able to to take it beyond. Uh, and that's okay. Okay. that though and I see like 15 things that I would change <laughs> and augment and do but you know like with any with any project you have so much time and and so much budget and so you just do what you can but and as an artist I'm never it's never 100% what I want but it's close one of the things that struck me about this when we were collecting clips last week for this uh, and, and ended up deciding to use something that's a few years ago just because it illustrates what, you know, what we were talking about so well, um, is how much more I watch the knife moving around that circle uh, in, in the final mix than I, than I do in the tent mix. And that's even now after having seen it so many times and having worked so much on the, on the final mix of that fairly short part of the film, um, I, I still find myself much more aware of the knife when we, when we listen to the final mix. Uh, which was, you know, to the director, um, the the primary focus of the scene was was that the passing of that knife around the circle. Um, so that's the kind of difference that that uh, the kind of perspective that she brings to it really can can offer, I think, um, and uh, and in a way is sort of the difference between editing sounds for placement and and editing and sound editing for storytelling and sound design, um, which, you know, Per Hallberg, who's won a, a couple Oscars for uh, sound work, um, is fond of calling it telling stories with sound. Uh, and, and both of us have done that in various points in our career, and I highly encourage anyone who's interested in getting into sound to really work on things that don't involve visuals um, as an exercise, if nothing else. Uh, I did a lot of work in radio advertising, which he, he, most of what you hear on the radio is hardly uh, interesting storytelling, but every now and then you get an opportunity doing what I was doing um, to do something like the concept came to me of uh, a guy's going to fill his pool with orange soda and swim in it because he can, because he just won the lottery. So how do I tell that story with just sound of a guy filling a pool with orange soda? Um, so that kind of thing. So, so in some of those, those elements that you kind of can't pick out in this thing, in this clip, were elements that I pulled through the whole movie. Obviously, this is kind of a dream sequence. It, it might be a dream. You don't know if, if she's really doing it. She's having some sort of vision quest. You, know, you, you never really know. But there were several of these through, 
out the film. And so I would bring in some of these elements, even within her waking day, when it was clear that she was in reality to us, but her brain was starting to, to go somewhere else. And I would bring in these very subtle elements, and that would go, pull the entire picture together from beginning to end. Um, and that's, to me, as important as to augment the music and tell the story in, in any way that you can. Do we want to show the other clip from Do we have time? I think we have time. I think we have time. <laughs> So this is from the same movie. Um, this is a, an, another clip that, uh, again, we'll show the, the tent mix first and then, um, and then the final. So I actually forgot that was the temp mix. About 15 seconds into it, I went, what, what happened to that? No. It's the temp mix. That's why it wasn't in there. Those are the sounds I was missing the first time. <laughs> um, one more thing I wanted to add, and then we'll open it up to questions. But, but uh, I know Laura asked earlier uh, about specifically about Foley and how it plays into some things. Um, to me, Foley is this sort of bridge between, um, between sound editing and sound design. Um, 
it, it, it can be a very technical thing of just adding all these little sounds, footsteps, and picking up a piece of paper, and, and, and whatever it happens to be. But it also is the, is the part of the, of the sound work before the final mix that I think does the most in a lot of stories to, to really underline the action and really um, dramatize what's happening on screen acoustically, sonically. I call Foley the special sauce. People don't know, have no idea that it's there, but if it's not there, they do. It's, it's, it's the secret stuff. And I like being the sound designer and the Foley person, because that way I can kind of combine the two. I know when I spot it, I know I'm, I'm going to cut that, I'm going to do this, and then I can augment it with some Foley. So having those two together, I think, is it's kind of a luxury. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've worked on a lot of projects where we've, we've provided a part of uh, rather than the full sound package. And it, it's always a little, um, it, it's much easier to work with a Foley artist who's also your sound designer. Um, we can economize a lot more in that, in that way. And, and she knows what she's going to cover this way and what she intends to cover another way. So, all right. I think, do we have any questions? Uh, you guys spend so much time um, picture at, at, um, composing and things like that. How do you guys budget for your time, especially on a smaller project? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get paid? <laughs> we um, have this, this great term that we have learned from marketing called scope creep. Because <laughs> um, when it comes to sound, if it's not there, it's not there. If it doesn't sound good, it doesn't sound good. And nobody cares that you didn't get paid, and nobody cares that you didn't have time. All they know is that they heard this, and, and it, what, it didn't sound good. So um, we spend a lot more time than we get paid for on most projects because we're dedicated to making it sound good. Um, and we're getting better at that. We, we can give different rates. Like we'll, we'll, we'll give like maybe three different quotes. We'll give you this, this, and this for this amount, this amount, and this amount. Um, if there's deliver, different deliverables, then we can work with that. Like you, you know, if you get sold and you need M&E, then we could do that separately. Or we break things down that way. Yeah, I mean, we sort of start with what, what the project needs um, from the end forward. Uh, if it is going to be sold at AFM and it's going to uh, have a theatrical run, um, you know, those are the sort of, that's the biggest kind of thing. Uh, and we know we have to do everything for a filled M&E and we know we have to comply with all these various technical specs that we're going to have to comply with. We're going to have to d deliver to a DCP, whatever, whatever's going to be involved. Fortunately, we don't have to do opticals anymore. That's, 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 uh, that's a good thing. Uh, optical soundtracks, a dark day for all of us. But, uh, but uh, yeah, and then we work, work backwards from that. Um, there are some general rules of thumb that it takes about an hour for every minute of running time for almost every step of the process. So dialogue editorial takes, if you have a 100 minute project, it's going to take two and a half weeks, roughly. Um, some of the things are a little faster than that. Um, and what we have found is that, as everyone in the industry has found, is that that has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. We have more and more people who are looking for, um, for their budgeting, we want to spend this much per minute, is, is what we want to do. And what can you give us for that? Um, and and we just have to sort of draw from our experience and, and how, how much can we give them for that. Um, and, uh, and, and we try to be very clear ahead of time with both ourselves and with the producers of the project what we're going to be able to deliver in the schedule and in the budget that, that, that we have to work with. Um, and, uh, and go from there, you know. So. Yeah, a lot of times the foley gets cut in half because that, like I said, it's the special sauce. I mean, sometimes to me, it, it's, it's the difference between a good film and a film that sounds professional. Um, and sometimes there's just no time or money to do that step. And a lot of times we're working with people who are doing calling cards, so they're like, well, we'll just do that. And, and then the next time they come back to us with, with bigger budgets, and then we, we can do a little bit more. 
um, we just we do the best we can. <laughs> and like she says, we put in more hours than we than we put in the bid almost always, <laughs> just because we love what we do. Every so, single job. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. On the uh, second one, the birdcage one, uh, I could. I could hear the knife going through the air, which I didn't hear on the first one. And then I heard some very low frequency kind of drama. Mm -hmm. And the question really is, do you add additional tracks to what the person before you did, or do you replace some of the stuff that was given to you? Um, it's a really good question. Um, usually, that's a question that I, ha I, I talk if it's if it's been given to me, and I talk to the director, and I say, "What do you, what is this about that you like? What do you want to keep?" Um, and I usually end up adding I don't know twenty tracks. All of that's probably I don't know you know. I just keep adding. I'm like, "Can I add more?" He's like, "Yeah, okay." Um, so I usually will just add and try and augment what they have because by the time it gets to me, the feeling set, the composer set, and everything. So what I want to do is just build that tension and build the movement and what, what they've already given me, especially from a project like this, because we kind of came in um, kind of late in the process. Yeah, that one, I don't, I don't remember the numbers right off the top of my head, but, but it was a pretty complicated OMF that we got um, because of all the sound work that Sterling and CK had already done. Uh, and, and so it was, I think it was probably 32 tracks or something like that that we got from the editorial department. And then we always max out our Pro Tools system. We mix on one Pro Tools rig, and we always have it full, um, which is 196 tracks. That's always. It doesn't matter what the project is. We always end up with me going, oh, why can't I have one more? So. Yeah, because yeah. I take them off. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I, I think you also kind of hinted at, at asking how much we keep of the original versus replacing. Do you replace anything in the original to get the drama, the sound that you're looking for? I have, yeah. I didn't necessarily in that scene, but there were quite a few scenes on, in here where, I mean, the, the video editor was charged with doing a lot of the sound, and he shouldn't have had to do all of that sound. And so there were parts where he did a really, you know, a very admirable job, especially for his time constraints and budget constraints. But the director was like, well, is there anything we can do about that? I'm like, well, yeah, that's, that's why I'm here. So I, I, I will do that and take them out and make them and change them. And, and, and if they've never heard it before, we'll keep those tracks. Yeah. And then if they don't like what I did, I'm like, well, no problem. Then we'll, we'll, we'll put the other stuff in. Yeah, we, we almost always keep, I mean, unless we're specifically told not to, we almost always keep what was given to us even if we don't intend it to be in the mix, just because you've heard it. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the time we really avoid doing that is when we are told by the picture editor that this was a temp sound that they, that they don't have clearance for and that they know that they don't want to use it. Um, but, but unless there's a legal reason not to have it in the mix, we always have it available um, to hear it even if we decide not to use it. We collectively, not just the two of us. Ideally, when would you be brought in? If you had your dream world, like when would you be brought into a production and what would be the advantages of bringing you in earlier? What could you do coming in earlier to production? Oh, yeah. yeah, we, we would love to be involved in pre-production. Um, we rarely are um, for, for a lot of reasons. I mean, a lot of good reasons. Um, uh, but we love to have conversations with the production sound team. It's not that we want to in any way impose a vision on them so much as we want to understand what they're trying to capture on the set um, as early as possible. And so that we can maybe work with them on, what, uh, on how those things can be done best so that they will transition well to what we're doing. Um, it, similarly with the picture editor, we don't want to ever get involved in telling a picture editor how to edit the project or how to even deal with sound in the project. But if they have some understanding of where it's going after them, um, and, and, and if that sort of chain of sound from the production sound team to the picture editorial team to us can be intact, um, 
I, I think it serves the project really well. Um, and it helps make smart decisions uh, that, that can ultimately save money. Um, we, uh, you know, um, Ryle Adamson, who produced uh, uh, Adventures of a Teenage Dragon Slayer a while ago, was fond of saying that you look around a film set and there are 50 or 60 people there who are devoted to the image, and there are three people who are devoted to the sound. Um, and, and yet, what we hear most often when people come to us is sound is really important. We know sound is really important. <laughs> so there is sort of a, there's a strange sort of, um, I hate the word disconnect, but I'm going to use it anyway. There's a strange kind of disconnect between that notion that sound, half of what you hear is what you see, or half of what you see is what you hear, and, and yet only 2% two, two of the people on the set are devoted to what you hear. Um, so yeah, we love to be involved early. We rarely are. We usually get involved at some point during um, picture editorial uh, to sort of talk about how that's going to be turned over. Um, so. As a sound designer, I would love to work with the composer as early as possible. So I know what's in the composer's head, kind of instrumentation they're using. I mean, if I can get the keys and stuff in my head, then it's, it's very important to me that my sound design blends when it should and stands out when it shouldn't. Um, and oftentimes, if, if you don't hear the music until you've done your sound design and you get on the mix stage, you're like, oh, that sounds terrible. It's very discordant. So if I can have those conversations and, and also, I mean, the composer and director usually are very kind of intimate together about what they want to do in their story. So I want to make sure that I am there to augment that and not in any way compete with that. So, you know, and that's usually, the composer usually comes on pretty early too, so there's that. Yeah, and it, as editorial has gotten more and more on set, I, I'd similarly like to see um, post audio getting more and more represented um, at that stage of the process to, to get involved in, in what kind of, um, you know, things might come up later. Um, so. And it, it actually can save money. Yeah. <laughs> it can save money for production. Like, we, 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 go, we go on set and you're like, well, this is how you're going to shoot this. Then we're going to spend a lot of time in post getting rid of that sound that's up above because you sh if you just put a you know, tarp over that, it's going to hold the sound in. Or in that you spend a lot of time in post cleaning up dialogue and if you can avoid that and we know what we can do we know what our limitations are with the tools and a lot of production mixers don't because that's not their world so we're there to support the production mixer and and the producers and directors like this if you do this you're going to save money on the back end so question as a sound designer um you, you talk about tools a lot. Hey, sorry. You talk about tools a lot. And yeah. um, is there a tool that you specifically are drawn to and then usually use? You usually uh, go to the library? Do you usually use reverbs a lot? Or have you used synthesis? I've been getting a lot more into synthesis lately. And um, is there something that you guys gravitate to? That's a really good question. Um, my tool base is pretty much the same um, for every project, but how I use them and how I utilize them is different for every single one. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a sound designer, so I have a vast, huge sound library, um, which is often inadequate, especially when I come to a, a new project. So my favorite thing to do is when we go out, we go out in the field and we record. Like we spent a day on, can I tell them that? Breaking the law. Breaking the law yeah. um, <laughs> to record some really cool sounds. Um, <laughs> but they're amazing sounds, and um, I like to use them a lot, and I can use them in different ways. I, you know, you, you, know you, can, you can compress them, you can, you can alter the pitch, you can stretch. Um, I think you know, every sound, every, every movement has a sound. Uh, what, no matter what, if it's a thought process, it has a sound. So those, I use instruments, I use, I mean, you work in Foley, I know. So you, you know how to create the sound you want. And I'm constantly going around listening to things. People think I'm weird. I'm just like, oh, listen to that. That's cool. Um, but that's, that's what I do. And so also, I've got this guy who he knows some of the, of the really cool plugins and the tools. And I say, I talk to him all the time. Like, I want this sound to do this and then that. And he's like, hmm. 
okay, give me a second. And he, he plays with it, and, then it and, and he does it. So he does a lot of the, of the tool work in, in that kind of arena. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I have two questions. Uh, do you guys, when you're editing stuff, do you aim to have a large dynamic range or only what it feels right? And the other thing is, uh, which is your favorite ear candy to use or sweetener? Sorry, what was the second? Favorite. Ear candy, the ear candy that you like to make, or little stuff that you say, this is what I like, sweeteners and stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we can answer that second yeah. question. <laughs> um, the first question, you know, every project is different. I mean, we've done everything, like I said, a Steven Seagal film, so everything's big. Everything's big. Loud, explosions, knives, gunfighting. And, you know, there's not a huge dyna dynamic range in that. Um, we've also done uh, recently a, a PBS special where everything is much more um, controlled and precise. Again, not a huge dynamic range, but a lot more. Um, but pretty big for broadcast. Big for broadcast, yeah. yeah. I mean, every project asks for a different mix. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I tend to respond most to a broad dynamic range. I, t I tend to like that. Um, but it isn't always right for every project, and, and, and we really, you know, are very conscious of, of, of what's right um, for a project. And, and, and even with something that really kind of wanted a very broad theatrical dynamic range, but that had to fit within the constraints of broadcast television, um, we have to make sure that, that we're conscious of not only the creative intent of the project, but also the technical constraints of the delivery. Um, and favorite ear candy, I kind of joke that, that we can't say it because it's our special sauce, but um, I don't know. I'll tell you what it's not. It's not. What? She hates that sound. I can't stand yeah, that really sound. It. Yeah, it's my pet peeve. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to come and stand between you two.